I felt completely bewildered and overwhelmed by how much adults know and how hard it is <laughs> and, and how little access we have to our own minds and the workings of our own minds. And therefore, how hard it was to figure out of all the different things we know and of all the things we can do, what's actually fundamental and what's kind of been built on top of that. And so for me, a, an infant is a much simpler system. Infants know almost nothing about the world. <laughs> If I have a religion, my religion is science. I believe in science. I think if we look back over human history, we have seen more progress in science than in any other domain of human culture. If you compare what we know now to what we knew 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, I mean, the differences in the domain of science are immense. This is Brain Inspired. So these all seem to me like hard problems, but solvable problems through the interdisciplinary enterprise that you have here. So thanks for listening. That is the sound of people clapping for Liz Spelke at the end of her keynote talk which opened the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference in Berlin, which I just got back from. The goal of the CCN conference is to bring together ideas from the study of natural and or artificial intelligence to characterize the neural computations uh, that underlie our complex behaviors. You've heard me on the show interview a bunch of the speakers from that conference, so it was really fun to go and connect with them in person as well. The conference was a good time. It is a strong and budding uh, community. And being there, I really got the sense of the challenges that there are uh, for the different disciplines that study natural and artificial intelligence to come together. And you can sense the desire to continue to come together and work across disciplines and, you know, figure all this stuff out. I won't give an overview of the conference here, but I will have plenty more to say about it in the coming weeks as I have on some of the other folks who are there uh, and get their impressions as well. And I want to say thank you. Many of you approached me to say hi while we were there, uh, and that was super fun to meet many of you in person. So thanks for the kind words. Uh, the encouragement. I even got some critical feedback, which was awesome. So that's uh, much appreciated, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. There were some of you that I missed that I had intended to come say thank you to for supporting the show or for being on the show. (laughs) So I will correct that next time. And man, what a strange experience uh, on the last night of the conference for me to hear uh, music from my show playing in the background during the last little mixer party uh, among the other music. So I was among the crowd and I started kind of feeling this vague familiarity rise up in my thoughts and kind of had this feeling like, oh, that sounds like a good song. Uh, and, And only then did I come to realize it was the song from my show and someone had put it into the musical mix. So whoever you are, uh, that was thoughtful, made me literally tingle with delight, and it's uh, making me smile now, as maybe you can hear. Okay, today's show. What cognitive tools do we start off with in life that serve as the foundation and or the scaffolding for all of our other cognitive functions? If we knew that, and we knew how to build it, Uh, Would we be able, like Alan Turing proposed, to build child-level AI that would itself progress into more sophisticated adult-level AI? What makes us humans so special cognitively? Or at least special enough to believe that we're pretty damn special? Why do my children not love me as much as they love their mom? Where are my children? Liz Spelke knows the answer to some of those questions. Liz is a professor at Harvard who studies what makes us uniquely human, and she does that by studying the cognition of young developing humans, usually infants. So Liz has been successful for a long time with numerous uh, awards, trophies, medals, standing ovations, 
Uh, I'm sure she's had lots of personalized cakes made in her honor. But uh, recently, those of us wanting to understand both natural and artificial intelligence have taken a keen interest in her work. Um, So we talk about her experience of the recent (laughs) rise in interest in her work uh, from the AI community and her work on cognitive development. And we discuss some of the core cognitive abilities of infants, uh, what we all enter the world with, and the limits to those abilities at that age, and why those limits uh, could help us better understand intelligence. And finally, before getting into a few general topics, we talk about why she thinks that language is perhaps the key thing that makes us, as humans, special. Uh, Although, as Liz knows, this is not a new idea, Uh, that language is the key thing, Uh, we do have new means of understanding why and how language might be the key. We did get cut off multiple times while I was interviewing her um, because of Harvard's apparently unreliable internet, Uh, but hopefully I pieced it together well enough that you either can't tell or it's uh, not too distracting. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 48 where you can also learn how to support the show through Patreon. Thank you to my recent Patreon supporters, Matt, Carson, Dean, Anand, and Ben. Uh, I've mentioned on the show that I'm creating some content that will eventually be available to purchase. But if you're a supporter of the show, you will have access to and be a part of that uh, creation process. Okay, wishing you all a full recovery from jet lag if you traveled like I did to the conference. And otherwise, wishing you success and fortune in your endeavors. I hope you're doing well out there. Okay, here's my conversation with Liz Spelke. Liz Spelke, baby wrangler extraordinaire. Thank you for bringing your adult talents to the show today. Uh, And welcome. Thank you. Liz, how often do you get questions from parents uh, about their own kids and what to do? (laughs) <laughs> as as infrequently as possible uh i have I've, uh, from all the years that i've studied infants i've learned really nothing that parents want to know about how to make their kids happy how to get them to go to sleep at night any of that i wasn't terribly successful at, at that as a mother uh or as a grandmother but basically all i've learned about it has come from that experience not from what i do with babies in the lab all right i'm crossing off the rest of my questions here then for this day <laughs> All right. So, right. <laughs> hey, you're giving a keynote address at Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference in three, two days, three days, two, two days, days. Two yeah. days. I, I fly to Berlin tomorrow. So it's yeah, it's two or three days, something like that. I do, too. So I'll be in the audience, actually. Um, and and oh, great. This will have this won't air until after that happens. So, you know, okay. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes here. So um, but but. Yeah. So, so that's the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference, and it's all about bringing together AI people with cognitive science and neuroscience people. And you've given lectures at MIT's Brains, Minds, and Machine uh, course, which are online. They're great resources for people. And of course, I'll link to those things. I'm curious if the interest in your work from the, that the AI community, from the AI side, has increased in the past few years. I had hoped that this would be the case like 40 years ago on my first sabbatical. I guess it's not quite 40 years ago, but in 1982, I took my first sabbatical after grad school and four years of teaching um, and went to MIT to the newly founded Center for Cognitive Science. And I was all excited to be interacting uh, with people in uh, computer science over, you know, how can we model what we see babies doing in the, in the experiments that we're doing. And I think it was just too early at that point. But, you know, there was a lot of interest in modeling adult cognition, which, you know, was, was in vogue for a while. And then, of course, went through a series of changing seasons. Uh, there was also interest in modeling simpler animals like flies. But I didn't get a lot of traction at that point when I talked about infants to that community. Uh, So it's really only quite recently that I think maybe uh, both the uh, cognitive sciences have gotten to a point in understanding human development and also Hmm. computer science has gotten to the point in building intelligent machines where we can start to have a productive uh, conversation. So I'm excited that that interest is starting now. Oh, yeah, because it seems to be running rampant right now. You're getting a lot of knocks Mm. on your door. 
<laughs> so, so the title of your talk, you're the first person that I've interviewed that's giving a keynote that actually, we can actually talk about a little bit more about what you're going to be talking about because everyone else is like, oh, yeah. it's so early. I have no idea. The title of your talk is uh, from <laughs> yeah, Cork. My, yeah, yeah, our conversation is not exactly happening early and I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, but I'm so glad it is. So the, the, the title of your talk is uh, From Core Concepts to New Systems of Knowledge. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and guess that you're going to be talking about centenarians or midlife crises, or what are you going to be talking about? No, I'm going to be talking about infants. And uh, part of my talk is going to be about, the, the part of my talk that I'll, I'll give with more confidence is going to be about what the interdisciplinary field of developmental cognitive science has learned about what infants know at the beginning about the world that they're then thrust into and able to uh, to learn about. But then the question that I'm really most fascinated by is the question, where does development go from there? And uh, mm -hmm. how do infants begin to figure out what particular world they've been uh, born into and what the people around them are doing and what objects are doing and how you can move from one place to another in this <laughs> world and so forth. How you develop basic common sense over the first five years of life or so before you get in the business of going to school and uh, getting formally instructed. Kids are doing a lot of learning. Some of it is the kind of learning that we see in animals as well, depending on very basic general uh, mechanisms that evolved long before we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of it, I think, are uniquely human learning processes. And those, I think, are the processes that yield whole new systems of knowledge, not just new facts about the world or new individual concepts one by one, but whole new systems like mathematics or mm -hmm. uh, uh, science. And, and some of these, like um, the system of natural numbers, Numbers, kids come to before they get to school, they're uh, constructing this new uh, knowledge on their own. And I think their course of development is going in a very different direction from what we see in other animals in that respect. So uh, I'm very interested in that. Uh, I don't know how kids do that, but I think we're at a point where that's a tractable question. If you can bring together the kinds of people that CCN is bringing together, people mm -hmm. working in multiple disciplines on the question, what is intelligence and how do you create it in a machine? How do we understand it in our own minds? And I think one, one way, certainly not the only way of going at that is to ask, how do we understand the mind of a very young child who's taking the first steps in deploying this human intelligence that we have? So I, I mean, just going through my little, my little scientific uh, education I, one of the things that really scared me was development. I thought, God, it's, it's such a mess. How are we going to figure it? We can't even figure out adult cognition, for instance. How are we going to figure out development? So, so you've, I'm glad you've I'm got glad it you're backwards. It. Oh, well, <laughs> think, we'll talk about more, more about that. So, so yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you have it exactly backwards. I, and when I started graduate school, I felt just the opposite. So uh, the field I was going into it, it, as a grad student was cognitive psychology, not uh -huh. developmental. And uh, I felt completely bewildered and overwhelmed by how much adults know and how hard it is <laughs> and, and how little access we have to our own minds and the workings of our own minds. And therefore, how hard it was to figure out of all the different things we know and of all the things we can do, what's actually fundamental and what's kind of been built on top of that. And so for me, a, an infant is a much simpler system. Infants know almost nothing about the world. <laughs> uh, so yeah. way more tractable problem than trying to understand you and me or, yeah. I mean, speaking of trying to understand what's going on in minds well uh, you know it's it's a little easier to ask adults questions than it is to ask infants questions so we'll we'll, we'll get to the how you actually probe that in just a bit here but um but what do you think we need more of or better of to to uh to start probing these questions that you're asking do you do you think we need better experiments better models more data better theory etc Yes, and yes, and yeah, yes, and like, yes. Yeah. You have to choose <laughs> no, one. I mean, it's I multiple think we need, choice. I think we need, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, I, think we need, I think we need more of all of this. I mean, so one thing that I think research over the last 40 years has shown is that we can, we can ask babies questions and get answers from them. Sometimes their answers are really surprising, and that's, I think, when they've been most useful and moved research in new directions, moved us to ask new questions and look at our own abilities and infants' abilities in mm. new ways. Mm. Um, so I think, yes, we can do that. 
But I think that the kind of behavioral research that I do is much better at figuring out what infants know than at figuring out how they know what, what they know or why they know what they know. <laughs> and it's the how and the why questions that we really want to answer. And for that, yeah. I think we need a broader interdisciplinary effort. We need to understand how brains grow and learn. We need to understand um, cognition in non-human animals because for all that we take are learning in new, uniquely human directions. Nevertheless, it's based on basic systems that we share with other animals. Um, and I think we need to understand, we need to work with computational models to understand better what kinds of functions these brains and minds are performing that's uh, allowing learning to happen. Hmm. Well, uh, is there anything in particular that you want to take away from from being at this conference in a couple of days? Yeah, so... What I think I, I get most out of uh, conferences is new ways to think about questions that I don't know how to answer yet. Um, mm. So one thing that I'm pretty convinced is true is that all animals, including us, come into the world uh, equipped with cognitive resources that bring us genuine knowledge about the world in advance of our experience with the things we have knowledge of. So before a baby ever encounters an object, a baby understands basic properties of how objects mm -hmm. behave, how they move around, how they interact with each other. Before they ever can pick themselves up and navigate through an environment, they have a basic ability to represent the geometrical structure of space and how one path connects to another uh, and so forth. And similarly, for understanding of other people as creatures who are like themselves, who can communicate with them and share experiences, or understanding animals and people as agents who can act on the world and cause changes. These are basic conceptions that are there there and ready to support children's learning at the very beginning of life. Mm. Uh, but how do they get there? And what's going on over the course of fetal development uh, right. that gives us ask. these abilities? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm actually really, this is, this is out there, I know, but I'm actually um, excited to engage with people who study things like imagination, sometimes called replay or preplay or things like that, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, in the brain and in the mind, and in the possibility that maybe some relatively simple programs for generating experiences that simulate the world might be part of our genetic endowment, you know, that the, the ability to, to grow those mm -hmm. might be part of our genetic endowment and actually prepare the brain for the kinds of basic experiences that our early learning is going to build on. Oh, this is great. I'm looking forward to your talk. And uh, are there going to be questions and answers? Or it's there, there won't be because it's a keynote, huh? I have no idea how this works. This is my first CCN meeting. So yeah, well, it's only been around. It's, do only, it. it's only above infancy, actually. It's only been, this is the third year, I believe. So yeah. Well, here's what I'm wanting. I want you to give me a question to plant. I want you to plant a question and I'll ask it at the end. And then you can uh, look even smarter than you are. What, what's the, what question <laughs> should I ask you at the end? What are you wanting someone to ask you? I don't know. We'll figure it out as we go along. <laughs> All right, we'll see. I'll, uh, I'll I'll try to come up with a good one then. Okay, so so there's this classic argument for studying the brain to inform artificial intelligence, and it goes like this: that it's very simple. The brain is the only example that we have of general AI, so it makes sense to study it. So I have a, I have a pitch for you, and I don't know if you've already pitched it this way, but what do you think of this advertisement for cognitive development? Um, a good reason to study early developing cognition is that it is the only example that evolution has of, of a solution that evolution has come up with to build brains, which are the only example of general intelligence that we have. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think that... Um... Uh, neuroscience and cognitive science are, st are studying the same natural phenomenon in complementary ways, and uh, each field is enriched by the other. Cognitive science, I think, is particularly useful for trying to figure out what the brain is doing, what problems it's trying to solve, which simply yeah. looking at the brain in itself, you don't get a, a, a clear sense of. But I think that our, our just personally, uh, the, the, the advances that have been made in neuroscience in fields like navigation and vision have been transformative for me in thinking, in thinking about cognitive development, especially when we see um, infants, uh, when we study cognitive capacities in infants and discover that those we have every reason to believe that those capacities are shared by other animals mm. and therefore research using all the panoply of methods from neuroscience applied to other animals, as well as 
the panoply of methods like controlled rearing studies that are that that at least traditionally were common to neuroscience and beha the behavioral sciences are available to study the development of these uh, these abilities. That's been an extremely powerful mm. uh, tool. Yeah. So yes, no, I think all of these fields uh, <laughs> belong together. They kind of naturally. Uh, go together. Yeah. So yeah, uh, th there should be lots of uh, occasions like CCN where people in these different fields get together. One of the reasons I think why uh, people have been re interested recently in your work uh, is because, like you said, we've we've come to the point where the technology has um, become better. We've been able to uh, build bigger and better models. We have more data. But the idea of sort of modeling developing humans. Uh, for AI is an old one. So Alan Turing in his 1950 yeah. paper proposed building child-level AI that, you know, with the goal of it developing itself into an adult-level intelligence. And you've pointed out that Hermann von uh, Helmholtz appreciated the need to do experiments with infants uh, to understand how we do things like perceive 3D objects and color. And he also appreciated the uh, difficulty in performing. Yeah, he actually thought it was yeah. kind of impossible to for perform those experiments on, on yeah. infants. But do you think that yeah. uh, it's the right, that, that building toddler level AI, do you think that's the right goal? Is that the right way forward? Forward for who? For AI? For, for AI, cognitive yeah. science? For, 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 for okay. building intelligence, yeah. I don't have an opinion on that, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 well, I do have an opinion. My opinion is there is no one right way forward. That I don't. My my reading of the field is it has not gotten to a point where it has converged on a single right way forward. I do think there's a very good reason for some people to be attempting to build machines that start out knowing what infants know and that learn uh, as best we can determine in the ways that infants uh, learn, which is the argument that you gave, that this is the one existence proof we have that it's possible hmm. for an entity to right. develop human level general intelligence. <laughs> infants do this, right? Um, yeah. So I think it's a very proof, it, it's gonna be a good approach. Whether in the end it'll turn out that, you know, the ultimate goal of artificial general intelligence has been met but through that path or through other paths I wouldn't presume to um, to, to make a prediction on that I think if I were investing in AI I'd probably want to see a hundred flowers bloom and people trying all <laughs> different sorts of uh, ways of, yeah. uh, of getting there I do think it's a very good thing to be trying what, what do you think that cognitive development can contribute to AI well I think that two things one is, I think it's undeniable that everything that, that an animal or a human of any age learns builds on what they already understand. And we shouldn't simply be trying to build machines by taking something that has no internal structure. Well, it's got an architecture, but it doesn't have any basic understanding of the world at all and expect that by simply giving it sensory experiences, it's going to gain that understanding. Hmm. Um, I think that's just going to turn out to be be true. Whether the best kinds of things to give it are what uh, Darwinian evolution has, has given to infants is another question. Yeah. But there's going to be initial structure there. And I think that... Um, uh, studies in cognitive development can help people to think about what sorts of starting points should we have for a system that we want to be able to go out in the world, interact with objects, look at things, and learn. Uh, so I think that's that's going to be um, really important. A second thing is, although we don't understand, I mean, there's a lot of debate currently in the field about how children learn and what sets human children's learning apart from the learning of other animals. There's a lot of debate about that. I think we're at a point in the field where there are some clear hypotheses that have a chance of being right, and they're testable. Testable, especially if you can bring to bear work that looks at brains and work that looks at uh, behavior and, and uh, uh, work that looks at uh, computations and tries to, you know, play with how these, how these putative processes play out in uh, in machines. I think we're at a point where these questions are, are testable, which makes this a really exciting time, I think, for people in any of these disciplines to be looking at human cognitive development and trying to figure it out. Hmm. I, yeah. I, so, d Despite our uh, current president of the United States, there are differences between babies and adults. And <laughs> so what are some of the differences between infants and adults that uh, that you might see, I mean, there are obvious differences, but what are some that you might see as key to understanding how to build intelligent adults uh, and or machines? 
Yeah. So first of all, I don't want to lump all ages of infancy together. I mean, to me, the fundamental distinction is not between infants and adults. It's between what we start with and where we go from there. The processes that take us from our beginnings to the kind of general common sense intelligence that um, uh, five-year-old children show. Uh, to me, that's kind of the pinnacle. After that, you know, you go to school, you're instructed. <laughs> it's a little more yeah. straight for ruined. Yeah, it's a little more. Uh, uh, it's not quite. It doesn't have that same self-initiated spark that I see uh, there uh, early on. Yeah. Um, so I think the fundamental difference that, and it's very different from what I thought we were going to see when when I first started studying infants. I wanted to understand what's unique about human minds, and I thought that the youngest infants would be the ones who would tell us that, because they would be the simplest cognitive system that was on this path that was going to be so different from yeah. every other animal. And to me, it was a huge puzzle how we could be so different. How could we be the only creatures on the planet who remake the world, who imagine things that don't exist and then invent them, you know, who, who change the world so radically? When, when you look at our brains, when you look at our perceptual systems, our action systems, all of our basic abilities, we look so similar to other animals, so similar that most of what we know about ourselves comes from research on other animals, right? Mm -hmm. What sets us on this different path? And I thought that studying young infants would answer that question. And as best as I can determine, I was 100% wrong about <laughs> that. Uh, that what we find when we study young infants are these fascinating and wonderful abilities to represent objects that aren't there and track them over time and uh, anticipate how things will interact with each other, to represent number and quantitative relationships between different uh, sets of things, to represent the spatial layout and figure out how it would appear from different directions and how you could get from uh, one place to another. We see all these wonderful abilities, but when we turn to other animals, we see the same abilities in them. And I think it's only at about the end of the first year of life that I see really convincing evidence that babies are moving in a direction that's going to carry us away from other animals. And the point at which I see that, or think I'm seeing that anyway, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, my hunch is that that's where the change is happening, is that that seems to be the point at which children have learned enough of their native language that they're starting to get in the business of learning from other people by discerning other people's thoughts from what other people say. Mm. So language learning begins before birth, before kids are even born. They're hearing speech sounds in the womb. Uh, they're, they, they come out into the world and they can distinguish speech in their own from someone who's speaking their language versus a different language. So it, language learning is a continuous process process. But I think there's a point at about a year of age where kids have learned enough of the sounds of their language and enough of the relationships between individual strings of sounds. Maybe th we should be thinking of them as words at that point, maybe something prior to full-blown words, but but strings of sounds connecting to things in the world, predicting what's good, what they're going to see from what uh, other people say and so forth. That's all happening continuously over the first year. But I think around the end of the first year, kids have worked out enough of their language that they can understand full sentences as conveying thoughts. And at that point, they can get in the business of learning from other people. And really, despite the fact that we see young children exploring autonomously, curious about the world, trying to find things out on their own, children's learning, I think, is also really deeply social. And a lot of what they're learning about the world, they're learning from people around them, not because the people are explicitly teaching them, but because from the things that people just naturally say, with no pedagogical motive in mind, <laughs> from the things that people say, people convey an enormous amount of information about the world and about their beliefs about the world and about abstract stuff that's not in the here and now. And once you understand enough language that you can... It, it, get a thought from someone else about something that's not happening immediately before you right now, hmm. I think that's that's a step that, that uh, uh, no other animal is able uh, to take and that an infant can't take until their language learning has progressed. Um, uh, to that point, so so I do, so I do see a qualitative change there that distinguishes the younger infants from the rest of us. Yeah, well, so we'll definitely we're going to come back to language um, as a, a key difference in uh, in what sets humans apart and makes us unique. So before we get there, um, a couple things. One, how do you experiment with infants? Uh, so so there's like one standard paradigm, right? Am I right? Yes well, and no. 
Okay. Yes and no. <laughs> There's one that you have used uh, most frequently, at least, which is preferential looking. Um, and yeah. uh, so do you want to just describe what that is really quickly? Sure. First of all, a, dis a disclaimer. I have never invented a single paradigm for studying infants. So the, the method was actually developed by people working in vision and psychophysics. And uh, it was used to... Uh, power, beautiful work by people like Richard Held at MIT, mm. charting the development of stereopsis in infants from the simple fact that if you put goggles on them and showed them two fields of stripes, one of which presented disparities such that it's like a 3D movie, you're seeing those stripes uh, arranged in depth, and the other of which presented flat stripes, and showing that babies would look reliably longer at the side that had the depth uh, variation, uh, and then doing these gorgeous psychophysical experiments to show that it wasn't that they were attracted by double images. It was only under the conditions in which images are arranged such that for an adult observer, you see stereoscopic depth. Only under those conditions did you see it in the infants, right? So you could run the whole field of psychophysics on an infant using this simple measure of looking time. And of course, the nice thing about looking time is that Babies can't do much early on. Uh, so if you really want to do developmental studies like Held did that go all the way from a one-month-old infant up to the point where stereopsis is fully functional, you need a measure that, that is, that's, that's accessible to infants of all, of all those oh, different ages. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's the real virtue, I think, of um, preferential looking uh, measures. But what I always tried to do in my own research was actually come at the same problem with different measures. So when we were studying what I thought at the time, I think it was at the time, was object perception, not what babies know about objects, but just if, you, if they look out at an array of objects, can they tell where one thing ends and the next thing begins mm -hmm. or things like that? We tried to engage infants with a variety of different uh, measures, like reaching for objects. If you want to see, do they see a boundary between two things? See whether they reach for, you present them with an array of two objects and see, will they reach for that array as if, as if it were a single whole, or will they reach for each part of it separately? And those measures converged with looking time measures that we're trying to get at the same ability. So I think the goal all along has not been to be wedded to a single measure but to be wedded to a set of questions and to follow them wherever they uh, uh, they lead. And looking time has been very useful for that. Liz, do you think that working with infants has uh, helped you, uh, is going to help you live longer and happier? <laughs> it certainly made me happy. Uh, will I live longer? I don't know. <laughs> What's been really fascinating about working with kids is that every step of the way, my intuitions about what they would and wouldn't understand, how they would and wouldn't react to some situation have been upended. I mean, it's been one surprise after another. And that makes it really fun. It's kind of like being in a mystery story that's unfolding. You know, you're walking through and living through and it's unfolding as you go. Oh, so, yeah, so interesting. it's been great. Um, you talking about the preferential looking also uh, just made me think, you know what a really cool project would be is to have some virtual reality goggle system where you could uh, key up any visual experiment or, you know, experiments that have been done in the past and you get to actually experience the experiment when, when studying it anyway. So get on that list. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, uh, so one of the main things that you study are these core cognitive systems that we're born with and many of which you've already yeah. alluded to. Um, and so let's just walk through a, a couple of them and then we want to, uh, and then we'll talk about the magic of human uh, abilities here okay. Uh, okay, as, as we develop. So uh, object representation is one, and uh, this is something that we're born with. And, um, and, you know, you can study until about 10 months, if I remember correctly from your, uh, from your work. So, yeah. so we, uh, like you, like you just were mentioning, we, we know what are two objects. We know what's one object under various conditions. Um, so I, I don't know what, what do we know about object representation? Okay, so um, the first thing we learned that was that babies don't simply represent the parts of objects that are visible. They represent the back of an object when you show them uh, the front. And when I say we, by the way, I don't mean me and my lab, I mean the field. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Philip Kelman did beautiful studies showing that babies represent the back of an object as well as the front of an object as it's moving around, for example. We learned that when an object is partly hidden behind another object, as long as it's moving, the infants extrapolate the connection between its different 
different visible parts and see it as a single um, connected body. Subsequently, and this really surprised me, I didn't expect this to happen, uh, we discovered that if an object moves totally out of view, the baby's anticipations seem to presuppose that they think it's still there behind uh, whatever's hiding it. Mm. Uh, and uh, they make specific inferences about what kinds of interactions between objects will happen when they're out of sight. If one object's partly hidden behind a screen and another one moves toward it, are they going to uh, are they going to collide and change their motion at the moment of impact? Right. Uh, uh, the evidence is that they do, and it comes from these studies using preferential looking and, in some cases, other methods to to get at how babies are tracking things as they move um, in and out of view. And then beyond that studies uh, showing that infants expect that when objects contact each other, they'll interact in ways that preserve the solidity of each of those objects. They won't interpenetrate, right? So mm -hmm. these are basic abstract properties of objects that as far as we can see, as early as they've been tested for in human infants, which I think goes down to only about two months of age. So there's there's a two month kind of window in there that hadn't been hasn't been tested for. As far as you can see, um, as early as they go, they're present. Now, what's happened with that information is lots of people started doing studies with monkeys or uh -huh. uh, with cats or eventually all the way down to newly hatched chicks. And the nice thing about doing studies on these other animals, of course, is that you could look at their brains, but you can also do controlled rearing. And there were beautiful studies done using controlled rearing methods with chicks showing that the very first time that a chick is exposed to an object, you see the same abilities that you see in um, in human infants. Actually, I shouldn't say the same because the chicks are actually a little bit ahead <laughs> of, of course, the infants. Yeah. <laughs> they've got better attention. They've got better working memory. So the chicks will actually solve problems that Piaget showed infants don't manage to solve until they're like eight months of age. The chicks will do it uh, on first exposure to an object. Now, they're in a high state of motivation because the method that's used in most of the chick studies is imprinting. So that object for them becomes mom, but they can be imprinted to mom under a very restricted set of conditions where they never get to touch her, where they never see her move out of sight behind an occluder or anything. And then the very first time they're presented with events where she goes behind an occluder, they expect that she won't pass through a wall, that she'll still be there behind that occluder. She won't blip out of existence there and appear somewhere else and so forth. Uh, so that's an example, I think, of where when we do studies on infants, they suggest questions that can be asked of animals mm -hmm. and the two fields can converge to uh, give us much more leverage in understanding what the role of experience is and isn't in, in, uh, in this development and eventually to, un uh, uh, to understand what the brain is doing and what the brain mechanisms are for tracking objects over time, representing their existence and how a brain comes to instantiate these abstract properties of objects like continuity and solidity and so forth. Um, but but you, you started out by asking me about core knowledge. And, and one side of it is that the knowledge that young infants have and that other animals have seems to capture very abstract properties of the world, like that objects exist continuously. They move on connected paths. Uh, they occupy space uniquely, so two of them can't be in the same place at the same time. Uh, but the other side of core knowledge is it's extremely impoverished. Mm. Uh, there's most of what we take for granted as properties, obvious properties of objects, infants and chicks seem to be oblivious to. So infants in particular uh, have been, you know, I'm, I've been really struck by the limits to what infants understand about <laughs> objects and also about the environment that you navigate through and about agents, you know, and animals and what they, and their, their goals and intentions and, th and things like that. Um, so infants have virtually no idea what an object ought to look like. Uh, my first hypothesis when we started studying object representation in infants was Gestalt psychologists will have it pretty much right. They'll expect <laughs> objects simple and regular in their shapes. Oh. Not true at all. Oh. Okay, they don't use uh, Babies don't use those Gestalt properties at all for singling objects out, figuring out where one ends and the next one begins. They were completely oblivious uh, uh, to all of that. Oh, don't they primarily use motion? It, um, is that one yes. of the limitations? Yes. yes, they do use motion. They use, but they use motion specifically 
that's consistent with there being bodies that have stable boundaries that are all in- internally interconnected, that are cohesive, you remain connected as they move around. So yes, the uh, motion is the primary source of information they get about the cohesiveness and the, and the um, persistence over time and the locations of, uh, of objects as they interact and move around um, in a scene. But other properties of objects, like what they should look like, these are things that the babies seem to be quite oblivious to. Mm-hmm. And that that distinction shows up in every one of the domains that uh, people have looked at, domains of knowledge in infancy. So if you, if you think about uh, what do infants and animals, and here it's the work in animals that I think is, is, is especially informative, understand about the world that we navigate through. I think the evidence is pretty strong that Uh, What animals represent is the ground surface and its borders. And that's pretty much it. They don't, and, and when I say they represent the ground surface, they represent the uh, geometric perturbations in the ground surface. Right. So if there's suddenly a cliff or if there's suddenly a wall or, or suddenly a, a, a bump or a gap in the ground surface, uh, animals track that. And, and when yeah, infants get old enough that they can start uh, uh, toddling around in an environment, they track uh, those properties. But they don't track really ob- things that look really obvious to us, like the color of a wall uh, or a very prominent set of uh, markings on the floor that don't perturb its three-dimensional structure, but do you know provide a you know abrupt change in patterning from one color to another or one shape to another uh, printed on the floor. They're completely oblivious to that. Uh, so I think that that this is it. This is a kind of a useful guide that. Um, Maybe the way to think about the the first steps of learning is that kids have everything to learn about the local environment that they're going to find themselves in. You know, what is my parent going to look like? Oh, that's another beautiful example. Uh, so babies come in the world expecting there are going to be people who will attend to them and engage with them and talk to them, make noises, vocalize, uh, uh, speak to them. And I think the, the evidence very strongly suggests it's from studies like of empathy where you could kind of pick out the individual experiments, but I think the evidence strongly suggests that they uh, infants assume that the, the, the creatures who engage with them have experiences like their own, mm-hmm. and those experiences mm-hmm. get exchanged in states of engagement. These are highly abstract aspects of the social world. But if you ask, what do they know about what people should look like? And you can do that by giving them a choice between two faces, a face of a human and a face of a sheep or a bird, right? Or you can do biological motion. You can give biological motion of the sort that a human body produces versus of the sort that a hen produces. And what you see is that uh, young infants are exquisitely sensitive to the distinction between an upright face and an inverted face, yeah. upright biological motion or inverted biological motion, and they are completely oblivious to the distinction between biological motion of a human versus a hen. So, you know, the, the specifics of what's going to be out there are learned later. Uh, and what, what babies seem to start with is this set of very abstract notions of what sorts of things they're going to be in the world. There are going to be people for me to engage with. There's going to be objects to manipulate. There's going to be uh, yeah. layouts to navigate through. They have these abstract notions, and then they learn the specifics uh, later on. It's almost like you have, so let's say object representation is a, a core cognitive ability, but then you have to think, well, what is core within the core, within the core? Yeah. So that, you know, so it's like, where do yeah. you start? And you got to go back yeah. to the egg and the sperm or something, you know? So, um one of the, one of well, the important... no. go ahead i mean no i don't want to go back to the egg and the sperm and i don't <laughs> think that asking for what's the core means getting into an infinite regress of some sort yeah. i don't think that's true right i mean i want to go back to the beginning of the child's encounters with an external world that actually has objects in it that actually has places to explore in it and ask at that point what do kids already expect that world to be like uh, mm. And what are they in a, and what are they neutral about and in a position to learn about? And I think when you put research on young infants together with research on other animals where you can do controlled rearing experiments, which are really, I think, critical to making headway uh, on um, on these questions, then you start to get evidence that allows you to do that. Now, this leaves open the question that you asked me earlier, what do I hope to like be able to brainstorm about with people at CCN? This leaves open the question of how, over the course of development, from 
from the egg, you know, through all the fetal uh, development, do you get to the point where you're ready to encounter a world that has certain basic abstract uh, uh, properties, a certain geometrical structure, a certain causal structure, you know, what set of events happens there? And I'm hoping we can understand those uh, those events. I don't want to just kind of push them away and go all the way back <laughs> to the egg and say, okay, we're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, fetal... fetal um cognitive abilities are going to be even harder to uh to assess but what one one of the recurring themes is in these core systems and we you know we'll talk about a few more here is is the limits uh that uh, are imposed why are limits important to understand uh, in in understanding these core systems yeah yeah um so i think the limits are important partly because i think imagine if there weren't imagine that we learned that Every ability that we have as adults, we could find in young infants, okay? If we did, then I submit we should not be wasting our time studying <laughs> infants. It's a whole lot easier to study adults and ask them questions. If, if we're going to see the same complexity <laughs> yeah. in a newborn infant that we see in an adult, let's just study the adults and right. leave the poor babies alone, right? <laughs> um, so I think it's the fact that they don't know everything. In fact, they don't know almost anything of what we know, right? What they know is the tiniest, tiniest piece of uh, what we come to know. That's what I think makes them really interesting and really informative about human cognition. So that's the substantive answer. There's also a methodological answer, and it, it goes sort of like this. When we study infants, if we can find a very clear profile of abilities and gaps, we can then ask, can we find that same profile of abilities and gaps in another animal? And if the answer is yes, we've got ourselves an animal model that we can use for probing the brain, uh, for doing com uh, building computational models of a simpler system than a full-blown human, et cetera. We can also ask, are there cognitive and brain processes in an adult that show the same profile of limits as we see in the overt behavior of the infant? And that'll help us to understand what happens to the infant's abilities. So, so one question that I stayed up nights over for a long time, a couple decades ago, <laughs> was what I'm studying in the infants, is this a set of, is this scaffolding? Is this a uh -huh. set of abilities like a reflex that keeps you that keeps the infant from uh, getting killed when they're a baby, but that's basically just going to be kicked away and they're going to learn to understand the world in some different way? That's possibility one. Or are the abilities that we see in infants the foundations of all of our abilities throughout life? If it's the second, then we should be able to find cognitive tasks where we can elicit those same, that same profile of performance in an adult. And we also want to be able to find ways of probing adult brains mm -hmm. where we'll see brain responses that accord with that pattern of performance. And I think where we've looked, we've seen that in a number of domains. It, the, the domain where it's richest uh, is um, action planning, navigation, spatial reasoning. Mm -hmm. I mean, there I think is the absolute richest domain where we can see the system that we find in infants in behavioral uh, experiments at work in our minds as, uh, as adults. And of course, of course, also at work in the minds of rats uh, and the brains of, of rats, where, yeah. where most of the insects came from originally. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so so I think limits are important for all of those reasons. And then, by the way, once we once we find these abilities in adults, there's a whole nother enterprise that can begin actually two enterprises. One is to ask, what's the relationship between the core abilities in the mind of an adult and all the fancy things that the adult does and the infant doesn't, right? Mm. And then people like, I, I love the work of people like Stan DeHaan, who show studying mathematicians, that when you give a mathematician some high-level problem to think about in mathematics, they activate, among other things, they activate the system that the that's active in a baby when they see an array of 20 dots and compare it to an array of 10 dots, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. That you, know, you can draw a line of uh, continuity there. You don't know what the causal relationships are or what the computations are, but at least you can say there's a continuity there, which gives us something to go on and uh, probing these abilities uh, further. So that's one enterprise. The other enterprise that becomes possible at that point is now you can turn to children. And maybe this is what you were um, asking me about before and uh, when you brought up children. Um, you can turn to children uh, who are just taking their first steps into a uniquely human domain. So say first graders who are just starting to learn arithmetic or just starting to learn to read. And you can ask, 
can we find evidence for this same system with the same profile of abilities and limits that we see in infants at work in some subsystem in the child yeah. at the point at which they're developing an understanding of symbols and this other uniquely human stuff? And, and, and can we move their understanding of sim, you know, symbolic math, say, around by exercising their non-symbolic abilities? So there's, that's kind of another research enterprise that I think opens up. And all of it ultimately is anchored to this ability to, to, to get hold of these very, very simple systems with these very distinctive profiles in infancy, and then look for those profiles elsewhere. In that sense, I think it's kind of psychophysics applied to central cognition, cognitive science. Oh, very good. So, okay, so object recognition, one aspects of recognizing objects, one core cognitive uh, ability. And, and uh, just as a teaser, with regards to language, I, I think it's fascinating that um, with regards to language and limits, that uh, pre-language uh, infants uh, consider like two things uh, to be when they join. I, I, I'm not describing the experiment well enough, but um, let's say I, the example you give is a truck and a duck and they come together and um, they're manipulated and babies, infants don't uh, can't distinguish between the two of them. They think it's like one object, right? When they're stuck together, yeah. even though they they look completely different. But then once they have the the faculty of, and they know the name duck and they know the name truck, then they can distinguish. So it's the language that's key for being able to distinguish these two objects relative to one, which is fascinating. Yeah. But. Yeah, this is work by by Fei Shu and Susan Carey, and it's had a huge influence on me. Oh yeah, and I think especially Fei has carried it uh, forward and showed that gone beyond the, those initial studies and showed that you don't even once kids uh, understand sentences, you don't even need to use familiar words like duck and truck. You can look into a box and you can say, "Wow, a blicket." A toma, and they expect there to be two objects in the box, right? Uh, yeah, as if yeah. you know, they, they've gotten to the point where they understand language enough that they can now use language to learn more language and make sense of nonsense words like blicket and toma, and they can use language to learn more about the world and make a get, a, you know, an educated guess about what's inside that box. There's going to be two things two, that yeah. she show, uh, Fei Shu showed. There's going to be two things. They're going to have different properties. So kids are at the point where uh, they can use language to learn more language and also to learn about the world. Uh, and I, to me, that that was the uh, revelation. Not that the younger child doesn't use the different features of the objects right. to figure out this thing that came out on one side with duck-like features and the thing that came out on the other side with truck-like features are two different things, right? I mean, that's the, that's the problem that the kids are getting wrong. And that and a bunch of other problems of that sort <laughs> yeah. are, are uh, uh, what the younger kids are getting wrong. But when you think about it, it's not always the case that all of the features of an object that you see at one time will be there when you see that same object at another time. If it, I mean, if the truck was a transformer, uh, it might change its configuration while it's hidden. If it's an animal, it might change its posture. Uh, yeah. So the kids are relying on a subset of the information about objects that we're capable of relying on as adults. Uh, but they're, but, but what they're doing within, you know, the, the limits of their abilities is they're relying on the most reliable information about objects. But what happens then once language comes along is you can go further and you can see what conceptual distinctions other people are making. When people use two different words uh, to talk about things inside a box, they're, they're indicating to you that there's two things there and that there's some important difference between them. Because hmm. if there weren't, they would have said a blicket and another blicket, right? right? <laughs> um, and I think kids are very, very good at picking up on that. Adults say these things naturally. I don't think we're trying to teach kids anything when we talk like that. But we're talking in a way that maximizes the efficiency and the relevance of our communications. And I think kids are built to take advantage of that, to assume that that's the case and to use it to learn about the world. And to me, that's what the um, shoe and carry experiments that you referred to are getting at. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, we, a few of the other. So there are six core systems that at least in my yeah, memory that they've talked so. about. 
Um, another one, I'm going to rattle off a few and then we'll kind of dive it a little bit deeper into um, one or two more of them before we move on. One of them is just uh, uh, the faculty of number, uh, you know, one, two, infinity. <laughs> it's like sort of our early number um, abilities. Uh, places so that uh, we can, you know, the the kids can navigate. Infants have some conception of place and some conception of geometrical forms, like shapes like triangles mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what I want to dive a little bit more deeply into, because we're going to come back to it, I think, is uh, that there are two ways in which infants represent agents. Well, people, I people. suppose. Yeah. yeah. One is people as agents, so that they, they distinguish between something that's inanimate and animate, which is, um, this ties back to my talk uh, with uh, Talia Konkol, who um, talks about animacy versus inanimacy in our visual cortex, um, and she'll be yeah. talking at CCN too. And, and the other is uh, people as souls, <laughs> as people, you know. Yes. Um, so, yes. Uh, so I don't. So let's wax pat poetic uh, for a moment, just about <laughs> about what what those core systems are for agency and and people. Yeah. First of all, I I, I should say that. This is by no means a universally accepted idea. Mm. I'm not even sure a hundred percent of the time uh, how how strongly I would bet on it. I, I just tended to assume <laughs> that if there was any system for thinking about people, there would be just one system, and it was really a whole bunch of uh, uh, experiments on infants that uh, kept giving these seemingly contradictory findings that finally drove me to this idea that really babies understand people by dividing and conquering and thinking about the minds of other people in two different ways. And one way of thinking about the minds of other people is that to think that other people represent the world as it's perceptually accessible to them, and they plan actions modulo their uh, representations of the accessible world, right? Taking account of what they have access to in the external world, they uh, plan actions, uh, they direct their actions to goals, which often are goal objects. Uh, they act efficiently, minimizing the cost of their actions. They choose goals of higher value over goals of lower value and, 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 and so forth. And this is all a system for reasoning about actions as in, in intentional, costly, and effective. Oh, oh and also, uh, they see people's actions as causal. They, they cause changes in the world. So mm -hmm. people, by acting, bring about changes in the world. Um, and that's one system. And another system is for seeing people as having experiences, like the child's own experiences, and engaging with one another, and in states of engagement, sharing those experiences, conveying their experiences to the other person, and picking up on the other person's experiences of them. And the evidence for this, I think, comes from two sources. One, which is hard to manipulate and be really sure about, is 50 years worth of experiments or observations is maybe a better term than experiments, observations on children's reactions to other people, children's tendency to imitate the actions of other people who look at them, their high sensitivity to another person's direction of gaze, the fact that a child will look much more at a face whose eyes are directed at them than off to the side. Yeah. Uh, all these, uh, their, their sensitivity to other people's speech, not what they're saying, but the fact that they're speaking to the infant and modulating their speech in the way that adults do when they talk, slowing it down the way they do when they um, uh, talk to infants. Uh, these kind, all, all of these things suggest that babies are prepared to be especially attentive to other people that we, looking at them from the outside, would see, say, are potential social partners for, the, for those babies. Um, but the other line of evidence comes from experiments where you put the baby in the position of a third party observer to an interaction between two other beings who have some of the properties of social beings, namely faces, emitting sounds that uh, seem to be contingent on each other and so forth. And there, I think the evidence is more convincing that infants distinguish between other people who are in a state of engagement with one another versus people who are not engaged with each other. Uh, they make different predictions about who's going to approach who, who's going to imitate who, who's going to talk back uh, to who in, in those different situations. And 
none of the constraints that seem to matter when you're reasoning about somebody's causal effects on the world, like are they in contact with the thing that they're causing a change in? Mm -hmm. Are they acting efficiently? None of those things seem to apply in the social domain. Even for us as adults, I mean, if anything, I think social interactions that are too efficient seem rude, right? (laughs) They're ineffective. (laughs) You're supposed to have small talk with the start of your interviews, right? Yes, yes. I really think that, you know, there's a different set of considerations that comes into play uh, when you're communicating with a person versus when you're acting acting on an object and trying to bring about a change in it. And kids, I I think, are able to view people, uh, other people, in each of these two ways, maybe even simultaneously under some uh, conditions, but the systems that are looking at what somebody's doing on on objects in the world versus who are they engaged with and what are they feeling and what are they trying to convey, uh, that that those are two different cognitive systems, I think. Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, a bunch of early core cognitive systems, and they have these properties that they're they're fairly independent. They, um, you know, they, they're shared by other animals. So at this point, we're just another animal. Um, these are innate, so that you know they're when we come out of the womb, they're there, ready for us. Uh, you talked about some of the limits. That's a, a core feature of these core systems is that they're limited, um, and they kind of set the foundation for for learning things later in life and becoming human, as it were. Um, some things like uh, like solidity, we know innately, right? Like from these core systems, but other things like gravity, we have to learn over time. Do you think it's important um, in general, do we need to emulate in AI systems how infants develop these cognitive abilities over time, or can we just skip and go in different orders, you know, and just build in what's necessary to the AI systems? Yeah, I think that, I think that's a good question. And since I don't work in AI, I'm probably not the best person to answer it. My own hunch would be that it's very worth trying hmm. to build an AI system that starts with the abstract notions that that human infants and other animals seem to start with. I think this is worth trying and then see uh, how that system, uh, what it takes to get that system to learn the rest. Uh, but but I, I wouldn't want to make the argument that that's the only path that yeah. makes sense uh, to try. Uh, people should try lots of different things. Well, one of the things that you've said that you, you think makes us, gives us a fundamental advantage and makes us human, uniquely human, is the ability to take these core systems and combine them and to have crosstalk between them to form abstract concepts. Um, right. And I, I've, I've heard you talk about both language and social cognition, and you've already talked about it today as examples of what, what make us special. How... So, so I am on board, right? You have these these core cognitive abilities, and then you're going to combine them, and then that's going to uh, give rise to abstract concepts. How might this yeah. happen, right? For instance, like like we were just talking about with uh, with people. So you have the core system of agents, and you have the core system of like a social uh, beings, and then you add them together, and you get people that we have abstract yes. concepts for. And this sounds like it's a great strategy for AI, like you just said. So two questions. One is just the grand scheme of like, oh, how the hell would that happen? You know, computationally, for instance. But the other thing yeah. I, I'm thinking of is so, so non-human animal, animals have the same core systems, but are missing this combinatorial magic. And, and so what is That's that right. magic? What's the magic? Yeah. Uh, so that, I think, is the great uh, uh, open question. I mean, another way to say that that question, I think, is what's distinctive about human cognition relative to other animals. And a third way to say it is, how do children learn? And and what puts children on a path of learning that's different from the learning that we see in other animals? I think those are three different ways of stating the same question. And I think we don't know the answer. And what makes me so excited about this particular moment in our intellectual history is I think we have the tools that we need to get to the answer. Hmm. So what I want to offer in my in my um, CCN talk is a hypothesis about this. Oh. Uh, and it's a hypothesis that could easily turn out to be wrong. I think it's the one that I would bet money on at this point, though. Uh, and that is that um, what's special about us is actually a very old idea. What's special about us is that we have um, the capacity to learn and use a natural language. And natural languages um, have a number of properties 
One of the most important ones being a property that I only came to appreciate over the last 10 years or so, largely through uh, interacting with computational folks. Mm. Uh, uh, so maybe I should start with that property. The thing about natural languages that I used to think was just a, a, a bug in the system, right, or an inconvenience, uh, and that I now think is a po super positive feature of languages is that they're learned. And they're learned from other people. Other people, you learn a language from people who engage with you and who share their thoughts with you by speaking. That's basically uh, how languages are learned uh, by kids. Now, the people who are speaking speak uh, relevantly about uh, and offer ideas that they think are worth spreading, right? Uh, you talk about things that you think are going to be interesting. You also tend to talk economically. You don't give too much information. You give the information that you think is really relevant to this situation. So now imagine you're a child and you're learning language from the people around you, okay? Um, the languages that you're learning, all of the human uh, languages, are productively combinatorial. So you have a lexicon, but you can always add new words to it. And now in these days, with all the insane pace of technological innovation, we're learning, we're adding new words to them all the time, right? So you can always add new words. But once you know the meanings of the individual words and the classes, the grammatical classes that they belong to, now you can form infinitely many expressions yeah. and magically somehow you get the meaning of the whole expression from the meanings of the words and the ways in which they've been uh, combined, right? So that means that language gives kids a very powerful mechanism for expressing any concept that any human could have, past, present, or future, but it also gives them a terrible search problem. And this is where I think interacting with computational folks uh, really got me going. Imagine you're an animal and you have an innate language of thought and it has all of the power that we use in using a natural language to express any concept that we could possibly invent or design or anything else. Put all of that into a mind of an animal and ask, what is the animal going to do with all of these concepts? Which one should they draw on in any given situation, right? They've got these gazillions of concepts in there. What is each of them going to be useful for? Right. And that's the problem, I think, that we solve by learning our languages, uh, learning them from the people around them, uh, around us, who speak about things that they think are relevant to the current situation and express their thoughts about that, uh, uh, that situation. What this allows for is that a child who's learning a language, some of the very mundane features of um, language learning, like word frequency effects, kids learn frequent words before they learn infrequent words, right? Mm -hmm. The more frequent words are going to be the words that the people in that particular culture that the child is learning to make their way in consider to be more worth using to express thoughts, right? So they're going to be getting the more useful concepts before the less useful concepts. They're going to be getting them in contexts where people find them to be relevant. I think language becomes a really excellent guide to help kids to navigate through what would otherwise be this immensely unmanageable service space of, uh, you know, conceptual possibilities to, to, to find their way to the concepts that are most immediately useful in the particular situations that the kids find themselves in. So for me, that's, that's really a, a, a central property of, uh, of language that I think makes it an extremely useful tool uh, for thinking. Uh, and I think it would be very fun to, to um, engage with uh, people in artificial intelligence about, who, who've made a lot, whole lot of progress in getting machines yeah. to understand and produce language, to think about how to leverage that to do something with language that children are already doing at nine months, nine to 10 months of age in Feishu's experiments. They're using language to learn about the world. They're using what people say to figure out what's out there as well as to learn more language itself. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, that's my current hunch as to what sets us on a path different from the other animals, starting with equipment that's so similar. Is is it language in itself? So I'm, I'm kind of visualizing, you know, these six core systems and then the thing that binds them together. Uh, and is it language is it itself or is it the faculty for language? And I'm not sure how distinguishable those two things are. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think those are the questions that we would need to get much more specific on if we wanted to build computational models of this kind of learning. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure what the re what the uh, best answer is going to be. Sometimes I think there just is this immense language of thought that every animal brain 
makes available. Mm -hmm. And animals just don't know how to search it very well. And we know how to search it much better because we learn a natural language. That's one possibility, right? But another possibility is no, the, the basic function of composition is used by humans or, or perhaps well there's two possi- two other two alternative possibilities one alternative possibility is that what's special to us is this compositional capacity to com- to combine anything with anything else yeah. uh, as opposed to simply within a particular dedicated domain clearly we have compositional abilities within the navigation system and so forth but this general purpose ability to combine anything with anything else could be um, uh, what's distinctive about us and i think a third possibility is that What's distinctive about us is our ability to create external symbols and use them and expect other people to create them and learn from them. Uh, and, and I think every animal has symbolic abilities. Symbols. I love. Uh, so I uh, one of the classes that I should have gone more more to that, that I should have attended more in college is about the origins of language. And uh, this was taught by someone who studied early cuneiform and, and um, just how language came about. Uh, in yeah. Mesopotamia and uh, in the Fertile Crescent region, Denise schmaltz bessoret I'm sorry that I didn't go to class more, mm-hmm. uh, but I loved it. <laughs> I, loved the, I loved the ideas. And her whole thing was, um, the idea was that language came about uh, from our ability to uh, represent symbols and to have an mm-hmm. internal internal representation of symbols, yep. which came from the external representation of how many sheep you get for however many, right. you know, wh- whatever I get for however many sheep. Um so I, I love the idea of, uh, of of symbols being important. Yeah. Thinking about natural language, I, we, you know, we don't have too much more time here. Uh, I recently heard Stephen Wolfram um, talking about code as a potential re- sort of replacement for language or, or developing a way to communicate. But because when you code, you're, you're doing, you're thinking computationally and you're thinking efficiently. And a lot of our language, it is efficient relative to many things, but it's also quite inefficient relative to other means of uh, c- mm. communicating. And he sort of envisions, I don't want to speak for him, but uh, the way he was talking, it's almost like he envisioned coding to take over. So he gives an example of maybe you'll go to a restaurant and the menu will be in code and not in a natural <laughs> language that we've developed. But I don't, I'm not sure that language seems to develop that way. I don't know if you have thoughts about this. Well, language changes all the time. And I think one of the reasons that it changes is that it is an extremely efficient system. And when our needs change, we coin new terms, we use new expressions, we take new shortcuts. Um, so, So actually, I think it's very, very likely that the language that we're speaking in the future will be different from what we're speaking now. I doubt very much, though, that this will happen because people design some yeah. new computer language, and everybody decides to adopt it. I think it's going to happen the way language change has happened in the past. As people's lives change and as their needs change, they they, they change the language with them uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the so that they can continue yeah. to communicate efficiently and effectively. Yeah. yeah. The beautiful mess that is humanity. Um, I, I also <laughs> really, I'm not sure if you're familiar with David uh, Christian. He teaches uh, big history. Any, it's a concept anyway. Um, yeah. I recently heard him talking about how he expressed what he has come to about how humans are unique is that essentially they accumulate information faster than the information dissipates, right? So other animals, uh, they might learn something about their life, but they can't pass it down because there's no way to symbolically represent it for uh, their future Mm -hmm. um, generations to just pick up. And language uh, is the key essentially in, in communicating from uh, human down the generations, um, and I just, I, it, and, and that has a lot to do with representing symbols. So I don't know. It's just, a, yeah, yeah, another. no, I think that's right. Um, yeah. internal language. So, okay. So we develop language and it let's, let's just say that language is the key here and we develop this, uh, cognitive ability. Uh, I've talked a little bit on the show. I had David Popple on and he studies speech processing and language. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I was talking to him about how language actually affects our own internal thinking. Um, so not only can we express some version of our internal thoughts, but by expressing them either internally, writing them down or expressing them in words, it can actually, uh, change what, what we think. Um, do you think Mm -hmm. that language is more important for our internal 
thought processes or for communicating with others? I think it's crucial for both. And I think that when we use it internally, we're communicating with ourselves in effect. Uh, so I don't see these as distinct functions. It's, it seems to me that language makes explicit certain concepts and 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 relations which that which makes them both communicable and and also gives us a medium in which we can think about them uh, better in many cases and and you've also mentioned uh, that the, the an early like social ability one of the, these core the core social system that we're built built with that we come into the world with yeah. uh, directly leads to sharing of feelings or, or empathy. Do, do you think that empathy will be important to build into AI or to build the, the core system that will lead to the learning of empathy? And do you think that will be difficult? Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I think. Actually, your question brings up a, a, a question about the future of AI, which, mm -hmm. which I don't have a good answer to. It's a question I've been thinking about a lot. It, it is, what kind of AI do we want? What kind of AI is going to be good for us and useful for us, right? Yeah. And will it be useful to have machines that not only have our common sense, but that have our feelings and that interact with us the way people do? Do we want machines that are going to be replacing people in effect? You know, and I can think of lots of situations where the answer would be yes, we would want that, right? Rather than having some really you know, bored, overworked person taking care of me in a nursing home in 20 years, right? You know, maybe it would be better to have like a very sympathetic machine doing that. I don't know. I can think of at least five people I'd love to replace. <laughs> in any case, uh, I think this is a really important question. Uh, I'm not convinced that we want machines to have empathy. And I'm fairly certain that we don't, that there are some machines that we don't want to have empathy. Let me give an example from today. We don't need to think about some, sure. some glorious future. Um, so my children and consequently their ch uh, grandchildren uh, have as a member of their household, Alexa. Oh yeah. And parents talk to Alexa. They ask Alexa what the weather's going to be tomorrow. They ask her to time something that they're cooking. They they mm. ask her for music and so forth. They don't say please and thank you. Uh -huh. They don't expect her to be able to answer hard questions. They treat her as a fairly stupid but useful machine. And I think, and I've, I've wondered in watching my grandchildren, how do they feel about Alexa? And I think they feel Alexa's a machine. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think I want Alexa to start showing empathy and to start giving my grandchildren the idea that we've brought back slavery. Alexa <laughs> has is human and we're treating yeah. her like our personal slave, right? You, that you don't need to be polite to, that you can simply, you know, get things from uh, without asking nicely. You know what I mean? I feel like we don't want that. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm, uh, what I mostly feel is... Our conversation has focused to the extent that it's focused on AI. It's on the question, uh, can research on human development inform the development of smarter machines, more effective uh, machines? But I think th there's another question we could ask, and I think anybody who's working in AI should be asking themselves this question, uh, which is, what kind of AI should we be developing with the ultimate goal of human benefit? And for that, it seems to me, it would be very useful to take another look at human minds and the development of human minds and ask, what are the circumstances in which human minds thrive, in which we develop a healthy sense of ourselves, healthy relationships with other people and so forth? And how can we build machines that will offload things that get in the way of our doing that, mm. but not, you know, create situations that get that... that the alternative, right? Creating situations that actually get in the way of our being human with each other as they start to take on more and more human-like uh, uh, functions. I think that's going to be a very important question uh, for people in AI to be thinking about and, and another whole oh, domain of questions hairy. that it could yeah. be really useful for people who study brains and minds um, uh, and uh, machines to be working together. Don't we already have enough to do? Come on. It's a, <laughs> what, uh, just quickly about the uh, the core systems. Are there any longitudinal studies that that are that ask the question if this infant uh, has this core ability and develops it at this age, then later, you know, like the marshmallow test, then later in life they'll yeah. uh, win a Nobel Prize or something. Yeah, it's not clear. Uh, it, 
interpretations of the marshmallow test have, have sure. been uh, changing changing recently but 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 I take your your question there's lots of studies like that they show correlations there's a huge lim, uh, limit to those studies they don't tell us what's causing what sure. so we know that you can use yeah. um, a child's core abilities to predict what's going to happen later but what but what we really want to know is what what's driving uh, that those later developments and what role are the core abilities playing in that. One thing I've gotten very excited about going beyond correlations is doing field research in education. And we're starting to do studies in India and other countries oh, where cool. we see, can we move children, children can, can we enhance children's readiness uh, taking especially children who are at risk of not doing well in school, can, if we if we able to play with them as preschoolers, can we enhance their readiness for learning school math? Mm. Or uh, we hope to look at things like learning to read in school, learning to learn from other people in 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 school by giving them the kinds of experiences that middle class kids will routinely get, but that may be less accessible to kids living in poverty. Um, and there, I think what potentially we can gain, in addition to the human benefit, I hope, is a greater understanding of what moves develop development forward in the real world on the time scales where kids are really learning. So I'm very excited about uh, that line of work, which builds off the findings that there are correlations in longitudinal studies between earlier abilities and later right. abilities, mm -hmm. but tries to actually get at causation. Man, so much to do. Uh, Liz, we've, <laughs> we've pretty much run out of time here. I was going to ask you about, you know, why women are so bad at science and uh, other, <laughs> right. other fun questions that you could answer in 10 seconds or less. Um, you know, I'll ask you two, two more quick questions. So, sorry, I was alluding to, you know, your, your, uh, I know. your previous I know, I know. <laughs> debates with Stephen Pinker on gender roles and, and just your work in general on, on showing that there's no difference between males and females yeah. uh, in infancy. I just had to get it there so I didn't get hate mail. Um, so, uh, one, how many years into the future would you want to jump uh, to observe what's going on for just a bit? I love that question. Uh, I would love to jump a short distance into the future. I'd like, like, like to jump like 10 years from now, maybe 15, because I think we're at a really exciting point right now in these fields that are coming together at CCN, CCN and I'm really excited to see uh, where we go from here. Awesome. Uh, finally, you say I don't know a lot. It's very admirable. It's, uh, uh, it's, you have a lot of humility. Uh, what do you think the right balance is uh, between sticking? This is a related question. What do you think the right balance is between sticking to your gut um, versus adjusting your beliefs about how to proceed just in science and moving forward in your own career in science? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me say something more general about science that will get to this point. OK, I think I. If I have a religion, my religion is science. I believe in science. I think if we look back over human history, we have seen more progress in science than in any other domain of human culture. If you compare what we know now to what we knew 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, I mean, the differences in the domain of science are immense. And I think they dwarf the differences that we see in any other domain. And that raises the question, what made this happen? Uh, why has science been so successful? And I think the reason it's been so successful is twofold. First of all, it's a cumulative enterprise. So people build on each other, just like kids learn from the people around them. Scientists yeah. learn yeah. from the scientists around them and they build on other people's work and it accumulates. And one of the things that makes it accumulate is that people do stick to their guns and they push their ideas as far as they can. So on that side of the question, I think that's one of the reasons why science has been so successful. But I think the other reason it's been successful is kind of on the opposite side of uh, your question. Uh, we get to ask questions of nature, but we don't get to dictate what the answer is going to be. What the answers <laughs> turn out to be depends on how the world turns out to be. So at the end of the day, we have to give up our cherished views uh, when the world is just keeps telling us that's not the way it's working, right? And that, and and again and again, that we see that that's happened in science as well. So I actually think I, I love your question because it brings up the two sides of the scientific enterprise, both of which I think are really critical to it, and both kind of together uh, account for its success in the past and make me optimistic about the next ten. Years. Oh, man. That's a beautiful place to end. You have a plane to catch to Berlin. So do I. Thank I do. you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And I'll see you in a few days. Thank you, Paul. It's been great. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. You can support the show through Patreon. 
for a microscopic two or four dollars per month, go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help sustain and improve the show and prohibit any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thanks for your support. See you next time. Like you're